Coming up on ScienceWorks, class is in session, in the ocean. But they're not learning to surf. These students are catching the wave for science. But first, we're going to see how science, technology, engineering, and math are used every day to help better protect our country. When I think of the Department of Defense or the United States military, I think of weapons and a dominant physical force. But did you know there are many aspects of the DOD that involve science, math, and engineering to develop new technologies to make sure we maintain the most advanced military in the world? There are tons of fun and innovative careers here at the DOD that use math and science. Let's take a look. We're here at the Soldier Systems Center at one of the Department of Defense STEM labs here in Natick, Massachusetts, a center for cutting edge studies and development of new ideas and products to help soldiers in every situation. I'm here with Dave Aceta. Dave, what do you do here? We are responsible for performance optimization. How can we improve the performance of our soldiers, whether it's through nutrition, through biomechanics, or cognitive science? It's an Army installation, however, we do have the Navy here, we have the Coast Guard, we have representation from the Air Force, and by virtue of the Navy's presence, we also have responsibility to the Marine Corps. That's everyone, right? That's all of the Department <laughs> of Defense, and including the Coast Guard. And you're a retired Lieutenant Colonel. Does everyone here have to be in the military? No, actually they don't. There is a number of soldiers who are assigned here, but most of the people who work here in the STEM disciplines, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, are civilians and most of them have never been in the military. So I could work here? You could work here if you had a degree in one of the science disciplines. Where are we going first? Our first stop is the biomechanics lab where medical researchers and scientists work together to improve physical performance. Are you ready? I'm so excited. Let's go. Let's go. We're here in the biomechanics lab, where they study how the body moves and reacts to different forces, similar to a professional athlete in extreme conditions. This is Becky, who works here. Tell us, what do you do here? I'm personally a civilian here, so I chose to become an Army scientist and work here to do science to help soldiers. Wow, Army scientists sound so cool. It's a lot of fun. We get to do work that we know has a meaningful impact rather than just being a scientist in a lab that you don't always get to see the results of your work. So what are we going to be seeing here now? So we have Specialist Gonzalez, who is wearing the female body armor that was actually developed here at Natick Labs. And she is wearing multiple of these reflective markers on her that we're able to track where her body is moving. And then she'll be walking on our treadmill, which has essentially fancy bathroom scales or force plates <laughs> underneath the front and the back of it, so we can get the forces going through her body while she's wearing the body armor. So right now our cameras are recording where each of those reflective spheres are on her. We have some on her feet, on her knees, on her waist, as well as up on her shoulders. So we're able to collect her whole entire body and how it's moving while she's wearing the body armor. And how heavy is that body armor? Um, so the body armor is about 30 pounds. That's a lot. It's a lot of weight to be walking around all day carrying, but it was designed to protect soldiers where they need to most be protected. And the female body armor is specifically designed to protect women rather than just the standard male body armor that had been issued. So it's one of those many scientific advances that's gone on here at Native Labs. Data is being collected from the multiple sensors and from the scales under the treadmill to measure the varying forces on different parts of the body. Scientists analyze the difference in forces when wearing no gear or when wearing 30 pounds of body armor or carrying a 120 pound backpack. All the tests are focused on maximizing performance while minimizing risks of injuries. We're looking at how to keep war fighters healthy and in the fight longer. Why do you call them war fighters instead of soldiers? So war fighter is a general term that doesn't encompass just soldiers, but also sailors, airmen, and marines. So we're studying all war fighters, not just those who are soldiers. This technology used on war fighters in the biomechanics lab also has been helping in non-military applications, including testing how people change after hip replacement or knee replacement surgeries. The data gathered can even help kids who wear backpacks to school. If you cinch the straps up really tight and get the load right behind your shoulders, you use 25% less energy than if your straps are really loose and the textbooks are all at the back outermost part of your backpack on the bottom. So you're saying they should 
pull it as tight as they can to make sure they use 25% less energy? If they have all the textbooks close to their back and up at the top, top of the backpack, they will use 25% less energy. I don't know what you guys did to me, but can you explain what all these dots are for again? So we're able to see how you're moving as you dance around and as you smile, we can see that you're nice and happy for <laughs> smiling for Army Science. When you look up on the screen, you can see every single movement I make in real time. So that's what we do here every day in the lab when we're collecting data. We see how people move in real time and then we do a lot more science and figure out what it all means. I'm in the anthropometry lab and I just got my body scanned and there I am right there up on the computer. This is Steve Paquette. Steve, what is this lab? Why do you scan bodies? We scan bodies primarily so we can understand um, subtle shape and um, size information that we can't get with traditional measuring tools. What is anthropometry? Anthropometry is literally the measurement of humans, trying to understand the different sizes and proportions that exist within the human population. And then we apply that data here toward the population of soldiers or war fighters so that we're able to provide a proper fit to all soldiers regardless of size. A proper fit has been even more vital in recent years as there's been a growing number of women in the service. The new 3D data has helped provide several new sizes for the female anatomy, allowing a more snug fit in clothing, body armor, helmets, goggles, and more. Data from 3D body scanning is also utilized to make sure uniforms protect adequately against burn injury. This is Peggy, and we're here at the Army-Navy Thermal Testing Facility. Peggy, what do you do here at this facility? So in here, we characterize materials against flame and thermal threats, and here we have our full-scale mannequin tests that we perform. We're going to engulf the mannequin in flame, and then we're going to measure how much heat is going through that clothing system to the mannequin, and on the mannequin there are sensors, and we'll be able to predict second and third degree burns. I see this mannequin's wearing a uniform. How well does that protect him? So this uniform is a flame-resistant Army combat uniform that was designed specifically to protect against IED threats in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it does really protect against that. Can we see it? Sure. Cool. Up next, we're going to put this uniform to the ultimate flame test, and later, surfs up, all in the name of science. Stonehill College is nationally recognized for its academics, commitment to affordability, and career preparation. Whether bound for the lab, stage, or stock market, our students develop the knowledge, skills, and character to achieve the highest goals. We're proud to offer dual degree engineering and business programs that allow students to attend Stonehill and our sister school, the University of Notre Dame. Near Boston and Providence, Stonehill inspires students to reach higher. Find out more at stonehill.edu. Living with chest pain was limiting what my husband could do. So when he was turned down for heart surgery, I had to help. We learned about protected PCI with Empower, the world's smallest heart pump. It's a less invasive option for some high-risk heart patients who are not candidates for bypass surgery. The Impella 2.5 and Impella CP heart pump provides temporary heart support during a high-risk PCI in patients with severe coronary artery disease and diminished heart function when it's determined high-risk PCI is the appropriate therapy. A protected PCI procedure with the Impella 2.5 or Impella CP heart pump is not right for everyone and only your doctor can determine eligibility. You should not be treated with the Impella 2.5 or Impella CP if you have defects in your veins, arteries, or heart valves. All heart procedures have risks. Many of the risks related to use of the Impella 2.5 and Impella CP are the same risks as for the cardiac procedure itself and the placement of any pump used to help the heart. Ask your doctor and visit protectedpci.com to learn more about the procedure and see if it may be an option for you or your loved one. We are so grateful that Protected PCI was an option for him and us. Every year, the average person generates nearly one ton of waste, with more than 250 million tons of garbage being buried in U.S. landfills annually. At Covanta, we are working to change that and ensure no waste is ever wasted. We believe the materials discarded every day should be utilized to their fullest potential to preserve the world's valuable resources and generate clean energy for our communities and the world we live in. This is how Covanta is powering today and protecting tomorrow. 
If you or a loved one has mesothelioma or any other asbestos-related cancer, call now. Asbestos manufacturers sold deadly asbestos materials to thousands of companies putting workers at risk. An estimated $30 billion in court-ordered trusts have been set aside to pay out claims to asbestos victims. You may be entitled to a portion of these funds and receive compensation without filing a lawsuit or ever going to court. For your free legal consultation, call 1-800-577-4280. That's 1-800-577-4280. I'm a non-attorney spokesperson. Attention all users of the dangerous blood thinners, Xarelto or Pradaxa. If you or someone you love are one of the thousands of blood thinner users that may have been exposed to the serious risks caused by these medications, including internal bleeding, you need to call Guardian Legal Network now. There are time deadlines to file your claim, so don't wait. If we don't win, you pay nothing, so call to speak to your experienced attorney now. Call 800-816-9038. Wednesday on an all-new Hacking the Wild. I let myself get wet. The cold's really starting to set in. Most people don't try to survive Alaska, like Andy Quitmeyer. Oh, God. Hey, bears. Get out of here, bears. But will his tech be enough to get him out alive? I think it's tonight. Electric fence. Okay. Totally lost. Let's see if I can get up around this cliff. It's really slippery. This isn't a good idea. Hacking the Wild. New episode Wednesday at 10 on Science and available on the app. We're inside the Army-Navy Thermal Testing Facility and about to see how well this uniform can protect against burns. Okay, here we go. in a movie. What do you do with the data now? There are sensors on the mannequin, so these are actually all the sensors on the mannequin. The sensors on the mannequin are analyzed to accurately predict the severity of burn injury to see how well the uniform protects from the flame. The blue signifies no burn, green shows minor first degree burn, yellow second degree burn, and red is the most serious third degree burn. So you can see the head has all third degree burns because there's nothing on our head out there. So the way the burn models work is um, you reach a certain temperature and then based on the time you stay at that temperature, it predicts how deep it's going into your skin. And so that's how you get that second and third degree burn. And you can see this did pretty well. The fire went out pretty quickly with the mannequin in the uniform. If the mannequin was wearing a shirt like mine, what would happen? It would probably just continue to burn and we would either have to go out and put it out or it would just continue to burn until there was nothing left. Can we see that mannequin in my shirt? Sure, well, let's put it on and see what happens. Guys, I'm about to light my own shirt on fire. Okay, here we go. Reality Laboratory at the Center for Applied Brain and Cognitive Sciences. This is Dr. Brunier. Hi. Hi. Where are we right now? You are in basically a giant video game. Um, what you're looking at here is a full field of view, so it goes all the way around you, wraps around you, and you can get in here, you can walk around, you can experience this virtual world. Um, what's really nice about these really big virtual reality systems is that instead of having something on your head that stops us from using other equipment on or about your head, we can have you in here completely untethered, so you start to behave in ways that we think reflect what you would do out in the real world, in your real experiences. This looks like the world's coolest video game, but how does it apply to science and math? 
what we try to do with these video games is try to control as much as possible in these environments, right? So as you're walking down the street, certain things will happen at certain times. We want to see not only how you behave or what you do physically, but also how your brain responds, how your physiology responds. So we try to measure what's going on inside your body and outside your body with behavior to try to understand your thought processes and trying to predict what you're going to do next based upon what we can measure with all these cool systems. We're in a virtual reality lab right now. I am all hooked up, ready to play. The volunteers who are studied in the VR cave wear these special glasses that track everywhere they're looking every moment. This electroencephalogram cap measures the electrical activity of thousands of clusters of neurons in the brain. And there's a shock belt. So the reason we use a shock belt is we want you to be a little bit worried about what might happen in this environment. <laughs> we also want you to actually behave in the way that you would behave in the real world where there are consequences. There are bad things that could happen based upon your behavior. And what this does is it gives you that little bit of that fear that you're going to have in the real world. <laughs> yeah. So at any given time, we might actually shock you. Okay, we're ready to start the game. Are you ready? I'm ready. That was a really fun experience. These are the computers that track the data? Yeah, so back here is where the scientists sit, right? So this is where we try to understand what's going on inside of your brain, um, inside of your mind. Um, and so what you're looking at over here is exactly what you're looking at at any given time. So you see the green dot moving around that actually tells us what you're looking at and when you're looking at it. Over here we have where we can actually look at your brainwave data. And so when it gets really red, that means that you have a lot of activity being produced in that frequency. When it goes down to blue, that means you don't have a lot of activity being produced in that frequency. What does that computer do? So this last computer over here is giving us some information on how fast your heart is beating. Like when you were scared about getting shocked, <laughs> yeah. your heart rate went way up. Your respiration rate increased, and that is how fast you're breathing. Wow, so we have my breathing, so I got really fast. Right, point. so this is when you told us that you wanted to be shocked. <laughs> uh, so you were getting really nervous yeah. about getting shocked, and what we, were, what we found is that you were breathing in deep and taking in a lot of deep breaths. You were fast and deep. Coming up, how would you like your classroom to be in the ocean? We're going to visit some students who get to swim and surf for their college classes, but they're not learning to surf. They're helping to understand the physics of waves. Surf's up for these swimming scientists. Living with chest pain was limiting what my husband could do. So when he was turned down for heart surgery, I had to help. We learned about protected PCI with Impella, the world's smallest heart pump. It's a less invasive option for some high-risk heart patients who are not candidates for bypass surgery. The Impella 2.5 and Impella CP heart pump provides temporary heart support during a high-risk PCI in patients with severe coronary artery disease and diminished heart function when it's determined high-risk PCI is the appropriate therapy. A protected PCI procedure with the Impella 2.5 or Impella CP heart pump is not right for everyone and only your doctor can determine eligibility. You should not be treated with the Impella 2.5 or Impella CP if you have defects in your veins, arteries, or heart valves. All heart procedures have risks. Many of the risks are related to use of the Impella 2.5 and Impella CP are the same risks as for the cardiac procedure itself and the placement of any pump used to help the heart. Ask your doctor and visit protectedpci.com to learn more about the procedure and see if it may be an option for you or your loved one. We are so grateful that Protected PCI was an option for him and us. Every year, the average person generates nearly one ton of waste, with more than 250 million tons of garbage being buried in U.S. landfills annually. At Covanta, we are working to change that and ensure no waste is ever wasted. We believe the materials discarded every day should be utilized to their fullest potential to preserve the world's valuable resources and generate clean energy for our communities and the world we live in. This is how Covanta is powering today and protecting tomorrow. Saturday, on the live finale of Mythbusters The Search, it all comes down to this. We're giving you water heater rockets. Oh! New Mythbusters will be confirmed. I am all in. The pressure's rising for us. And rocket into science greatness. You see this light at the end of the tunnel, and I want it. Good luck, buddy. Watch as we announce the winners live. The suspense is killing me here. Whoa! Mythbusters The Search, live finale, Saturday at 9, on Science, and available on the app.
Wednesday on an all-new Hacking the Wild. I let myself get wet. The cold's really starting to set in. Most people don't try to survive Alaska, like Andy Quitmeyer. Oh, God. Hey, bears. Get out of here, bears. But will his tech be enough to get him out alive? I think it's tonight. Electric fence. Okay. Totally lost. Let's see if I can get up around this cliff. It's really slippery. This isn't a good idea. Hacking the Wild. New episode Wednesday at 10 on Science and available on the app. There's nothing like the feeling of escaping the world and riding a great wave to shore. West Coast or East Coast, experiencing the rush of power and speed underneath your board is unlike almost anything else. But before we go catch a big one, let's talk to some surfers who are riding the wave of science when it comes to surfing. This is Dr. Robert Weaver, professor of ocean engineering at Florida Institute of Technology. Just a cool day at the beach here, huh? Absolutely, absolutely. We're getting ready to do some surfing for science. It's going to be great. Right in front of us, we have a deployment raft. And on that raft, we have two uh, pressure gauges that are being mounted on the cinder blocks. And what we're going to get from those pressure gauges is information about the sea surface elevation. And we're going to deploy one of the cinder blocks uh, right just before the waves are, are peaking up to break. And then we have a line that's 150 feet long, so we're going to swim it out another 150 feet and then drop the deep water gauge out there. And then what are they doing with the surfboards over there? We've got uh, these three custom-made boards here today. Each of the boards is going to be outfitted with an instrument. The two long boards have accelerometers uh, and magnetometers. What and, is that? Uh, <laughs> the accelerometers measure, as you would imagine, acceleration in all three axes, uh, and the magnetometers measure uh, inclination or direction. The magnetometers actually measure the magnetic field in all three axes and from that data you can figure out roll, pitch, and yaw of the board. Well, what's going on back here? Uh, so back here we're getting ready to deploy everything out into the ocean so we can start our field data collection experiment. So the first thing we want to do now that we've got everything set up is get the wave gauges deployed. We want to get those in the water as soon as possible so we can get a nice long record today, about an hour, hour and a half of, of wave data. It's really important to know what the wave height is, what the wave period, the wave length. We've got to get all those wave properties because you can imagine if you have a, a really tall, steep wave, a uh, surfer riding down that wave is going to have a lot more potential, right, at the top of that wave. And then riding down that wave, they're going to be going a lot faster than if you had a, 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 a small or very flat wave. And so we'll be able to tell that uh, once we get the data analyzed off these gauges. And this is so cool. You teach a class at the beach. I could have had them go to the government website and download a really long time series of data, and we could stay in the class and analyze that. But this is much, much more fun. Enjoy life one wave at a time. I really do love being at the beach and I love surfing, but I do like figuring out the data and being able to accomplish what I want from my data set. With this type of class, what types of jobs can these guys get after this? Types of skills that they're learning here, like developing the field experiment, planning the experiment, data collection, data retrieval, data analysis, that really translates to any field. But this is really a, a passion of mine. Uh, I, I, I love studying waves and water wave mechanics, and this is a way to get out and, um, and, and get the students just as excited. Can we go out? Absolutely. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. A bad day surfing is better than a good day working. Still ahead, Noel braves the waves, hoping to ride a big one to shore. Every year, the average person generates nearly one ton of waste, with more than 250 million tons of garbage being buried in U.S. landfills annually. At Covanta, we are working to change that and ensure no waste is ever wasted. We believe the materials discarded every day should be utilized to their fullest potential to preserve the world's valuable resources and generate clean energy for our communities and the world we live in. This is how Covanta is powering today and protecting tomorrow. 
Stonehill College is nationally recognized for its academics, commitment to affordability, and career preparation. Whether bound for the lab, stage, or stock market, our students develop the knowledge, skills, and character to achieve the highest goals. We're proud to offer dual degree engineering and business programs that allow students to attend Stonehill and our sister school, the University of Notre Dame. Near Boston and Providence, Stonehill inspires students to reach higher. Find out more at stonehill.edu. Sold for $1.66 at about 98% off on DealDash.com. DealDash is the most exciting way to score brand name, brand new products at prices you won't believe. Professional stand mixers for under $6 and pressure cookers up to 85% off. Touchscreen laptops for less than $16 and HDTVs for 80% off or more. So stop paying retail. Go to DealDash.com right now. Bid on wholesale clearance stock. Bid on warehouse closeouts. Bid on overstock surplus. And get free shipping on everything. Just make sure that you're the highest bidder. But hurry, the time is running out. Go to DealDash.com and sign up now. one way to find out for sure. Scientist Rob Nelson. Look at that. Uses advanced tech and new methods. That's allowing us to pinpoint our investigation. To one of the secrets. I've never seen anything like this. Hiding at your feet. I think we found something in there. Secrets of the Underground. New episode, Tuesday at 10 on Science. What are we trying to get here? Sometimes if you just study something out of a book, you don't really know it. You don't learn it in a way where, like, you absorb it. You know, here, like, we can say, oh, we were out on the waves. We saw them. We felt them. We know what that velocity was. You know, we're wearing all these uh, watches here, these Rip Curl GPS watches. Yeah. yeah. So I can say I know my fastest speed was 9.3 today, right? I miles think per hour. mine's is 13.6, but because of that wave. Yeah. Really? Right? Yeah. That's how fast you're going on that wave. All right. So now you know. So you can like quantify things that before we just kind of talked about and said, didn't that feel fast? And now you can say it was fast. It was that fast. That was 13.6 miles per hour. This is George Robinson, the East Coast surf champion. He builds surfboards, and I just used one. That was so fun. I loved using one of your boards. So happy when somebody's stoked about the board that I built. I caught one with it. I know. I saw you out there. It looked good. <laughs> the surfboards here today are much different than other surfboards. Can you explain the difference between a regular surfboard versus the ones this class is using? The main difference actually is the instruments that are placed inside of the board. There's a cavity placed. The rest of the board is, is basically what you use to surf, so the only difference really is the cavity in the board where we put the accelerometer or the iPhones. Studying surfable waves doesn't always mean you're outside in the sunshine. We're back in the classroom with Dr. Weaver, and what do we have here? Well, what we have here is one of the, the hobo pressure sensors that we had installed in the cinder blocks that, that the guys swam out. Oh, yeah, I remember when they put them down in the right. raft. Yeah. yeah. So we had one kind of in a bit shallow water and one in a bit deeper water. And what we have here, this is the one from uh, the shallow water location, the one that was kind of closer to where the waves are breaking. The devices were recording readings every second, noting the time, temperature, and most importantly, the absolute pressure. The graph shows the actual wave field through changes in the water elevation. So, the team connects the time series showing the absolute pressure with the real-time observation from when surfers caught the best waves. What we're going to be seeing here is a video of Abigail uh, catching a wave as she's coming in. And then in this upper uh, tile, uh, one of our students has taken the data from, from the accelerometers here and processed them. And so we're going to see the pitch, the roll, and the yaw of the board 
as displayed here as she's riding the wave. Let's see. Go Abigail! Look at that. So you can see she's pitched up and the board's pitched up and, and here's the yaw as the board's kind of going a little bit back and forth. If someone's on their board coming in, you would expect the board to, to pitch as the wave's coming and then they catch the wave and go down and, and it would pitch back again. Uh, if they turn, you'd expect to see that signal in the yaw that this instrument would be recording. What happens if it goes like... <laughs> you see a really noisy signal. Okay. So surfing's not just all about being a beach bum. I think that's kind of a myth of, of the beach bum surfer. As a matter of fact, uh, students graduating from ocean engineering programs are some of the highest earners uh, within a year after graduating, and that's even just at the undergraduate level. Uh, once you get up into the master's level, uh, the, the salaries just continue to increase. It's a great return on investment. I'd like to thank Dr. Weaver, his class, and George Robinson for showing us how math and science are used in studying the surf. Hang 10, guys!